Good afternoon. I'm Barry Rabe, the J. Ira and Nikki Family Professor of Public Policy at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. On behalf of our Dean, Michael Barr, who is joining us today, and the faculty and staff and students of the Ford School, it's just a great, great pleasure to welcome all of you to this special policy talks at the Ford School event with Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. Governor Hogan and I will be discussing his recently published book, Still Standing, Surviving Cancer, Riots, and the Toxic Politics that Divide. This book touches on many important issues, including the current COVID-19 pandemic, the upcoming presidential election, the fight for racial equality. And we'll discuss many of these topics during our discussion today. This event is also part of the Ford School Conversations Across Difference series, where we try to highlight for our community, for our students, the kinds of discourses necessary for creating constructive policy across various spheres of difference. Before we dive into our conversation, allow me to briefly introduce Governor Hogan. Governor Larry Hogan is not a career politician, although he was born into a political family. He spent nearly his entire career as a small businessman until 2014. At that point, he started Change Maryland, the largest nonpartisan grassroots citizen organization in Maryland history. And he was ultimately elected governor, only the second Republican governor of Maryland in the last half century. He was reelected overwhelmingly in 2018, only the second Maryland governor in Republican history to win two consecutive terms. National rankings consistently show Governor Hogan to be one of the most popular governors anywhere in the United States. And just last year in 2019, his gubernatorial colleagues named him, elected him to be chair of the National Governors Association. Just a couple of no quick notes about format. We will indeed have some time at the end of this conversation about uh, uh, to, to, to take audience questions. We've actually received some already, but you can also submit questions while Governor Hogan and I are talking to live chat on YouTube or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. With that, Governor Hogan, a very, very warm welcome to you. And thank you so much for being with us. Well, Barry, thank, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, it is not obligatory to be invited to policy talks to have University of Michigan tied. <laughs> it's a nice added perk. And that exists in this case where you have, you refer in your book to your experienced daughter, your, your, your daughter's, uh, Jamie's experience at the University of Michigan. Uh, we have a great photograph there of two members from your, <laughs> from yeah, so your family. Both of my beautiful daughters there, uh, Jamie uh, graduated uh, in, in 2000, uh, in 2000, uh, Two, and Julie, the younger daughter, graduated in 2008. Big, uh, go blue, uh, the, you know, very passionate uh, University of Michigan uh, fans. And I got the chance to visit them and, 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 and go to the big house and, uh, and to tour the campus. And my, my youngest daughter, Julie, actually lives in Ann Arbor uh, today. And, and uh, she and her, her husband and my beautiful little two-year-old granddaughter. So um, I do have that connection. Terrific. And we look forward to the day when you can again come back to campus. Um, yeah. You know, one other part of a University of Michigan type relationship, which emerged somewhat unexpectedly to me in reading the book, is your father, Larry Hogan Sr., former member of Congress, who I actually first saw as a high school student speaking in the House Judiciary Committee. You know where I'm going with that question. Uh, but particularly his relationship with Gerald Ford as members of Congress and then with the Watergate transition. Can you tell us a little bit about that part of your background and his experience with you know, our most distinguished alum, Gerald Ford? Sure, well, Barry, so that, that makes you and I similar in age because I was in high school also at the same, at the same time. Um, it's um, my dad, uh, who, who uh, I'm named after and who I'm really proud of, uh, who I learned a lot about integrity and public service from, um, he served on the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment of, of Richard Nixon and was the first Republican to come out for Nixon's impeachment and the only Republican in the Congress to vote for all three articles of impeachment. So 
uh, in that respect, uh, he had a lot to do with Gerald Ford becoming vice president and then president. Um, but I, I as a as a kid, a uh, high school kid, uh, got the opportunity to to meet uh, uh, later President Ford. But at the time, he was minority leader of the of the House of Representatives. He and his family, um, my, my, I admired him greatly. My, my father was very close with him as a member of the of, of the Republican Caucus uh, during that Congress. That was George Bush, the elder George Bush, and uh, Jack Kemp. My dad were all part of that uh, caucus that uh, Gerald Ford was the leader of. And uh, so I, I, I really got to watch him uh, as, a, as like you, as a high school uh, uh, person following that, uh, that whole, you know, I talk about this in my book, uh, a little bit about uh, Watergate and uh, the decisions of the House Judiciary Committee. It's probably the thing that my father is most remembered for. Uh, but I, he had a very close relationship with Gerald Ford and, and uh, as, a, as a young person, I really looked up to him and admired him. So one of the things that's often associated with Gerald Ford is bipartisanship. That's a word you use a lot in this book, even linking it to the notion of a purple surfboard that you brought out and used in campaign events, kind of bringing red and blue together, if you will. And yet in times like these, is it even possible with the exception of a few unique cases, perhaps such as yours in Maryland right now, even talk about bipartisanship and what that might mean? Or when we use that term, are we really talking about a sort of a historic moment that is likely not to be revisited as we look forward? Well, I, I sure hope that it's not just a, a, a historic look backwards about uh, nostalgia, about how, how good things used to be. I really believe and hope that we can have uh, more of a return to civility and bipartisanship um, I know it's hard to imagine nowadays in, uh, in this heated political environment uh, that we have and uh, the, with all the divisive uh, politics, um, it, it seems as if the entire political system is broken and people are just frustrated um, and angry. And um, I, I really, but I think the, most people in America really uh, would like to see um, people work together across party lines. Uh, Republicans and Democrats to, to, you know, obviously you can be passionate about the things you care about and, and fight for the things that you care about, but without demonizing the other side. And that was something back uh, Gerald Ford was known for. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, obviously my, my father set an example, but I think back then you, you would, you would passionately disagree on issues on the floor of the Congress uh, but then afterward, they would be friendly with one another and their families knew each other and they would have dinner together. It was not the, the politics of destruction uh, and, and, and demonizing the other side. Sometimes today, it seems like people are more interested in winning arguments than actually solving problems. Um, and so I was elected in the bluest state in America uh, as a Republican and then overwhelmingly reelected. My legislature is 70 percent Democrat. And I think... Uh, the reason uh, why people seem to uh, support what we've been doing is because we we have worked across the aisle in a bipartisan way to get things done. And I think governors who have done that uh, in, in other states um, have also been successful. And uh, I think it's what most people want. They just want politicians to tell it like it is and to uh, really work on fixing the, the serious problems that face us instead of just playing politics all the time. So one of the immediate issues before us is the coming election. And you know, both you and your dad took unique and huge political risks by challenging an incumbent president from your own party, crossing that person. Why have so few other Republicans, given the controversy surrounding Donald Trump, taken similar steps? In your book, you talk about your, many of your Republican colleagues who stay silent, swear allegiance, and blindly toe the line. Now, how do you explain that? And if you were running for re-election as governor this year, how would you deal with the issue of running with an incumbent president for whom there are points of substantial disagreement? Well, I, I had to uh, deal with that exact situation two years ago when I was re-elected in 2008. Uh, with uh, Donald Trump as president, with all the divisiveness in the in the country, um, in a what was considered to be a huge uh, blue wave in one of the bluest states in the country, 
Um, I won an overwhelming re-election, but I w there were certainly headwinds that I had to deal with because in my state, I think at the time when I was running, the president had a 29% approval rating. Um, and uh, there were a majority of Marylanders who said they would vote against every single Republican just to send a message to Donald Trump. And so I overcame that, I think, by, um, by just being direct and telling it like it is. And I, 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 it, to me, it doesn't matter whether an idea comes from the Democratic side or the Republican side. I look for the best ideas on solving the problems. I stood up and, and spoke out when I disagreed with the president, um, which a lot of people didn't. But I think the reason why it doesn't happen more often, and, and I think I was rewarded by the voters of my state who said they, they liked the independence and they liked the bipartisanship, they liked the, the tone and the civility, I tried to focus on what we were accomplishing in Maryland rather than getting dragged into the whatever uh, tweet there was that day or whatever divisive angry uh, food fight they were having in the, in the nation's capital, which is right next door to us. Uh, but I, I think this is what p p people really should be looking to, the candidates themselves and not the party label. I mean, I think people in my state, it's only 26% Republican, but I, I keep getting uh, uh, elected because people are willing to cross over and, and not, they're not voting just for a political party. They're voting for the person. And that's really the way it should be. You, know, you should vote for the person that you believe is going to do the best job and, 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 uh, and blind loyalty to the, to the party is, uh, is not, uh, not the right way to go in my opinion. But the reason why people don't take the stand, obviously, um, they're, they're afraid. I mean, they don't want to be tweeted uh, about. They don't want to be attacked by the base of the party. They don't, they don't want to be, have somebody run against them in a primary. Um, I, I wasn't afraid of that for, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I learned that example from my dad from back in the 70s with Richard Nixon. But it wasn't easy for him. I mean, he, he was the party came after him pretty hard for standing up and doing what he thought was best for the country. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in, in retrospect, I, you know, I learned that lesson very well. Now, you did give some thought to running as a primary challenger. You had a lot of people, not just from your state, saying you really ought to jump in this year and engage in a primary challenge. And you talked pretty candidly about this in the book. Columnists like George Will referred to you as a potential beer keg with attitude, a kind of unique phrase in American politics as I experienced it. But if you had mounted that campaign, how would you have confronted a president in your own party mindful of these broader themes of bipartisanship and civility that you have tried to develop in what have probably been a pretty difficult political situation. Yeah. How would you have approached that? Yeah, well, so I just, I, I never really made any attempt at running for, for president or challenging the president. There was, it, it sounds silly and it sounds like uh, it's just a spin, but the truth is this sort of bubbled up on its own. You know, when I, when I was able to win, you know, we lost, governor's races across the country. We lost the U.S. Senate. We lost seats in the House. Republicans were getting beat all across the country in 2018. I, in a very deep blue state, was overwhelmingly reelected. And, and I won the support of suburban women. I did incredibly well among black voters. I had a lot of crossover votes from Democrats and independents. And people said, wow, how, what is that all about? How did he accomplish that? And um, I, in my inaugural address, I, I I, on my, my second inaugural, I, I talked about some of these concerns about the broken politics and, and uh, the divisiveness in Washington. And, and uh, I think Jeb Bush was introducing me. Uh, who, and he said I was the antithesis to what was going on in, in Washington. And it just sort of people started encouraging me to consider it. I, I really didn't think there was a path uh, to winning a primary this, uh, in this year's race because the, the Republican base was pretty solidly the primary voters were pretty solidly behind the president. Having said that, I do think there's a, a majority of people in America, uh, certain polls have shown them almost 70% of the people who are frustrated with uh, the Democratic Party moving too far to the left, the, the Republican Party is too far to the right, and most people are somewhere in the middle, and they really do want to see uh, a good government and civility and people working together, which is why they've rewarded me and and people like Charlie Baker, who's a Republican governor of Massachusetts, uh, you know, who we, we have to work across the aisle. Uh, but I didn't think it was possible in 2020, even though I thought a lot of Americans might vote for a person like that in a general election. I didn't think you could win a Republican primary against a sitting president, which almost never happens. I'd like to turn to a few 
hot button policy issues, racism, <clears throat> policing, public safety. You were in the very early stages of your first term as governor when Freddie Gray died and riots broke out in Baltimore. That was several years ago. These issues, of course, persist and in my own case as a former resident of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which has seen similar kinds of issues in recent weeks emerge. How do we deal constructively with these kinds of questions going forward? What are your thoughts about learning from your experience in Maryland, but as these issues emerge in so many parts of the U.S. with some deep, deep, deep problems and concerns? Well, there's no question. These are deep. Uh, there are deep problems and 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 concerns that need to be addressed. And um, the 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 death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, uh, really brought a lot of this to the surface and and brought um, some very I think constructive, peaceful protest. Uh, in some cases, though, it, it's resulted in in violence in in some of our major cities. I, I do have experience with this because, as you mentioned, I had just been elected governor. I'd only been governor for eighty nine days when, after the tragic death of of Freddie Gray, this was at the very beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it was after Ferguson, then came Baltimore. Uh, but I had been governor for uh, just a few months. And the worst violence in 47 years broke out in our largest city. Uh, and in, in just the first few hours, uh, 400 some businesses and homes were destroyed and burned and looted. And um, for, uh, 120 some uh, police and firefighters were injured and hospitalized. And the city was out of control uh, and the citizens were were crying out for help. And so I actually, as a new governor, uh, called up the National Guard and sent in uh, uh, additional state uh, police officers to back up the beleaguered uh, city. And we tried our best to stop the violence while uh, continuing to protect the peaceful protesters and the citizens of, uh, of Baltimore. And I went and uh, walked the streets of Baltimore for a solid week, uh, meeting with community leaders, um, going to Freddie Gray's neighborhood, um, walking the streets and, and meeting with the NAACP and meeting with faith-based leaders. And my goal was to stop the violence um, while trying to, uh, you know, listen to the real concerns and to start a dialogue and let people know that we were going to keep the city safe, but we were also going to try to address some of these issues. And I think some of the lessons that I talk about in my book, um, I wish that some of our governors and mayors had read the book because um, I, I think we found the right balance of of addressing some of the issues and lowering the temperature um, and while allowing uh, the the legitimate frustrations and protests to take place, but not allowing uh, people to be injured or property to be destroyed. and And I, I think we've you know we've got to look at this issue. We've got to address the problems of systemic racism, but we've also got to, you know, stop the violence uh, in our cities. It's 9-11. We think about issues of security, not just terrorism, but at this point in time, certainly one of the reasons we aren't meeting in person today is the COVID-19 related pandemic. Governors, including Maryland, give a lot of authority constitutionally to have a lot of constitutional authority to pursue public health strategies and yet how prepared were you for this kind of a public health crisis uh, given all of your other responsibilities including the topic that we just discussed and how do you think about the role of states like maryland versus other governmental entities in in, in working in a space like this what what have you learned in the, the pandemic era in maryland that you can share with us well, it's a it's a great question, um, and I've learned a great deal. Uh, this is this is uh, the most challenging crisis that most of us have have ever had to deal with, and it it sort of hit us from out of the blue. Um, you know, you're right. We have uh, uh, as governors uh, a lot of day to day responsibilities, um, uh, dealing with a global pandemic and an economic collapse that happens, uh, uh, you know, over a several month period of time is one that not not too many people were completely prepared for. I think the federal government was caught uh, uh, unprepared, uh, and uh, but it, so were states and and hospital systems. And it's uh, you know, I, as governor for five and a half years, we had been doing tabletop exercises on what happens if a 
pandemic breaks out, but it's one thing to, to talk about it and plan for it uh, in the abstract um, as an academic exercise. It's another thing to actually have it happen in real time where uh, all, the, all the citizens of our state, ha ha their lives are at risk uh, and this thing is spreading like crazy. Um, I, I was in the position, as you mentioned in your introduction, I chaired the nation's governors um, and worked across the aisle with, uh, with the governor of Michigan and all the other governors across America in a very bipartisan way. Um, the governors, I believe, stepped up and led in this crisis. And um, at, at the beginning, we were frustrated with, uh, with the response from the federal government and the preparedness. Now, they've made some improvements since then, but um, the, the role of the states became more important than ever. Uh, as we saw governors, Republicans and Democrats and states, all different types of states across the country had to step up and really uh, make life and death, de death decisions. Um, I, I think I, I enacted 60 some executive orders in a, a matter of a, a month or so, declaring a state of emergency, you know, uh, closing schools, shutting down parts of our economy, taking these actions to keep people safe, setting up procurement systems where, where we had to acquire hundreds of millions of dollars worth of tests and, and uh, personal protective equipment and in a very constrained market. So I think the, 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 it really takes the federal, state, and local governments all working together. Um, I think we did learn some lessons, and I think that uh, the governors are more prepared than ever. I think the federal government is catching up to speed, and I, I, you know, I think we maybe showed some of our friends in Washington uh, the importance of of uh, bringing people together, uh, as we were talking earlier, and, and avoiding the, the the politics as best you can. And just uh, this is a case where our job was to keep our, our most important job is to keep the citizens of our state safe. Now, I wasn't surprised in reading your book by how much discussion there was of your linkages and working with the president, the vice president, and leaders in Washington, D.C. But there's, as you know, a lot of engagement that you've had with other states, both through NGA, but also bilateral relations with individual governors, governors I have learned. But there's also a unique wrinkle in your case where you actually engage in kind of foreign diplomacy. You negotiate with a foreign government. You visit South Korea. Can you tell us a little bit about the literally what it's like to work with other governors on an issue like this that truly crosses boundaries, but then also to open up an avenue that we tend not to think of as being associated with state political power, and that is working as a head of a state with a head of another country to, to try to make this response. Yeah. It was an unusual uh, circumstance, to say, to say the least, but again, we were in this crisis um, and it's very constrained world market. And because of uh, the, the, the failures of, uh, of the administration uh, to uh, at the federal level to have developed a early on a, a, a national testing uh, strategy and to acquire all of these supplies um, and the things to keep people safe, each state was out there on their own trying to compete with one another and with the federal government and with other uh, countries around the world for these things that were not, not easily attainable. Um, and so back in, in uh, March, I, um, I, I, after not being able to acquire uh, tests in, in America, there, I, I spent 22 days negotiating with uh, South Korean companies after contacting the, the, um, the Korean ambassador and them putting us in touch with uh, President Moon and their administration. And we got, we acquired a half a million uh, uh, coronavirus test kits from South Korea. And we, we uh, chartered a, a, a passenger plane, Korean Air, uh, to fly these test kits into Baltimore, Washington International Airport. It was at the time when we made this acquisition. Um, we've now done 2.1 million tests, but at the time, this this acquisition of 500,000 tests was more than the top five states in America combined, and uh, it was uh, not. It was very unusual, but it was uh, critically important to our long-term testing strategy. Uh, but the, the work with the uh, governors that you mentioned, I led uh, 50 some uh, teleconferences or Zoom meetings like this uh, with all of the nation's governors, 30 some of them with the president and or vice president and the cabinet and the coronavirus task force. So it, there was more cooperation and more interaction between the governors than, than probably the last 20 years added together just in a few months. Um, and also, you know, we yesterday just announced 
the uh, a compact that I put together with ten states, uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation to acquire five million uh, fifteen minute very rapid antigen tests. Which again, uh, this was states coming together, and I I put the uh, this compact together with Rockefeller and brought the other nine governors into it: five Republicans and five Democrats. So we're continuing to to lead and continuing to work across the aisle to get things done. And and how widely is this strategy for states to begin to work? collaboratively. The one other case I'm familiar with that involves Maryland is REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which involves, I think, now 11 or 12 states, uh, a regional carbon cap and trade zone. Are these really right. exceptional examples, or, or is, is a lot of the work of a governor now really looking across state borders and boundaries? That's also a really interesting question. I, I think Reggie is a, is a great uh, example of it. And and by the way, um, I, I believe we started out with eight or nine states and we were one of the original ones, but I worked hard to get um, my neighbors in Virginia, uh, neighbors to the south and to the north, Virginia and Pennsylvania, to join in with us in, in the Regional Ga uh, Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a great example. And I think there are other examples, but you know, I, I, states uh, are making a lot of decisions on their own, but we're also realizing that uh, you know working across borders, across state borders, and and doing working collaboratively, uh, you can make you can make a dip, a bigger difference. So there are a lot of regional compacts that are being formed, um, and um, and and on different topics and issues. And and I think it's a a new kind of flexing of the powers of the states and the power of the states working together. The question then I'd like to put to you really next is drawing on the experiences you've had in all of these areas. How do we begin to rethink federal versus state responsibilities? Another really interesting book that's published earlier this year by Donald Kettle, formerly the Dean of the Maryland Public Policy School, talks about divided states of America and makes the argument that the time is right for a kind of fundamental rethinking of what federal and state responsibilities entail. Are we at that point? Or are we talking about more of an incremental set of shifts? But again, since you've been able to work so much at the state level, but also been thinking about even this larger federal or even national context, how do we reinvent federalism from a, a state a state house perspective to, to, to move forward and deal with some of these really hard problems? Well, I, I believe we may be at a turning point, and I, I don't think it can it can change overnight. But I think we already are started to move in an incremental uh, way toward uh, more power to the states, uh, states taking on more things that they didn't used to do, as I've been talking about. The, the, chairing the National Governors Association, typically this was not a very active uh, o organization. I mean, the, the various governors of the states and territories were members of this group and, and they, they have a staff in Washington and they, they just uh, they re never really uh, came together as a group of governors making real decisions on big issues um, in a body. Uh, but through this pandemic over uh, about a six month period of time, we became a, a, like a governing body and, and make decisions. And we pulled together and it got states unanimously to weigh in and push the federal government to utilize the Defense Production Act and push for uh, the, them to step up their testing capabilities and, and push them to uh, on stimulus uh, packages and the CARES Act and lobbied and uh, very strongly our, our, our friends in, in the House and the Senate uh, and the administration to get things done. So I think the power, the change in the relationship uh, between the, the, addressing this issue, how is federalism going to change? I, I don't know exactly how or when it's all going to take place, but I think we're already seeing um, there, there's been too much power in Washington where most people think nothing ever gets done, uh, quite frankly, and, the, and there's equal blame to go around on, on both sides of the aisle. Um, Again, people aren't looking for solutions; they're just trying to win political arguments. And things are getting done in the states. We're the kind of the laboratories of of innovation and democracy, and and governors are governing and and getting things done. And I think now they're starting to say they're frustrated. The governors are just as frustrated as the average citizen uh, that Washington seems to be broken. And um, and I think the power and the visibility of America's governors is uh, is at, a, at the highest level it's ever been, and all the polling I've seen over the past five years 
um, voters trust their governors more than they trust the president or the Congress. And I think it's we're closer to their problems and they, they, they realize that every day we get up to, to try to make sure that the, the things are running and that they're, the, the things they care about are getting done and we're not just making political arguments all day. And so are there specific areas where you would make the case then for a kind of decentralization or devolution, either shifting regulatory authority or funding from Washington to states or allowing latitude? Which, which policy areas or topics are, are especially ripe for the sort of thing that you're talking about? I think it's just in general, I think most governors on, on both sides of the aisle uh, would agree that, uh, you know, w w when you're closer to the problem and you're in your, like, for example, on the stuff, the CARES Act was great. The federal government had a role to play. They, ha they have the printing press. They have the money that we needed to get out. But the states are the ones that are, 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 are implementing it. Like, you know, we're the ones... Uh, federal unemployment, the money comes from there, but we do all of the administering of that. Um, uh, the assistance to small businesses, the, some of the funding came from Washington, but we're the ones that uh, went out there on the front lines to to uh, to get things done and to make sure that we were trying to protect those failing, you know, small business owners who are suffering. Um, what, with the uh, with the testing, which are now, you know, the federal government's in, investing and pushing really hard on 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 a vaccine. Um, we're getting things done in the state. 40 of our Maryland companies are working on the vaccine. But I think more, uh, both regulatory and financial, if, uh, if, if more of that can be done closer to the people, um, I think you can run things more efficiently, more cost effectively, and actually get things done in a faster way. And, uh, and not to say that there isn't a role for the federal government. Obviously, they're critically important. Uh, but I think the states uh, need to have more power uh, have more of the money and the decision making uh, pushed down to the state level. And do you see any signs in Washington that legislators from one or both parties are really interested in this idea and that this could actually become a something that would build a broader base of support? Or are we really talking about kind of a, a fringe idea that is still largely a, a conceptual alternative? Well, so I, I would say neither one of those. Uh, it's not a fringe idea because I think it's what most people would agree with, uh, not mm -hmm. just the governors, but the average person probably would agree with that, although I haven't seen any polling on that. Uh, but no, uh, there's not a lot of people in Washington that want to willingly give up power. Uh, and because of the divisive politics that we have today, and a lot of it is, there's a lot of reasons for it, but uh, has to do with gerrymandering and, the, and, 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 you know, the people in Congress, there aren't very many people uh, who, are, who are willing to work together uh, both on both sides. Um, so I, I mean, changing Washington is probably the most fr frustrating thing uh, that, uh, that I can think of. And it's probably what frustrates most people in America that we're, we don't ever seem to be solving anything. But um, I don't think it's a fringe idea. I think it's an important idea. I think more and more people are going to push in that direction, but trying to move anything through Congress and especially when you talk about giving up power. For example, I've been focused uh, for, for the whole time I've been governor for nonpartisan redistricting so we can address this problem of gerrymandering, which is, I think, is critical to our, you know, making our political system work. But you can't get people to vote to give up their own power. That's just very hard to do. Fair enough. Um, we have a lot of students watching today, and you've graciously agreed to meet later with a small set of Ford School students, for which we are very grateful. I'm looking forward to it. You, uh, you also talk about what, as a governor and a political leader, you use and need to make good policy decisions. You say at one point, normal people don't read policy papers. Yeah. Candidly, most politicos don't either. Well, you know, for 40s, <laughs> faculty students, we love to read them. We yeah. may like to write them. Um, <laughs> what advice would you offer for constructive engagement for those in an academic community, students, others, to play a constructive role in advancing excellence in public policy in this time and era? Sure. Well, no, I, I'm a big believer in the importance of, of public policy, and I didn't mean to insult any of the, of the 40s. Uh, uh, I, I was involved in a group called the Maryland Public Policy Institute, right. where we were putting together these incredible um, you know, policy papers about how to solve all the problems of our state. And we thought they were really interesting. Uh, and the people who took the time, who were the more people that were the most interested and most involved, 
thought it was really great work we were putting out. But it, it's not normal people, but the average person, the average, if you're trying to convince the general public, I, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but it's pretty low about the percentage of people that are going to read the policy papers. And so I took uh, that great policy work uh, that we had done and then tried to, with my Change Maryland nonpartisan organization, put it into uh, a, a way that we could communicate with the average voter who really is focused on their day-to-day -day lives and uh, is not spending a lot of their free time either uh, thinking about or reading the policy paper. So I think somehow boiling down the ideas and the thoughts about how we solve problems, how we come up with solutions to issues, um, but then you know, boiling it down uh, to uh, something that you can communicate to the average voter, I think is important. And that if we're going to, if we're going to try to bring about change, um, it's, uh, it's not just going to be the, you and I in the, in the forties that are, you know, that are going to have to hear these ideas, right? We'll continue that conversation separately, but point well <laughs> taken. One last question of mine, and then I'd like to turn to questions from the folks who are watching today. One big surprise to me in reading your book was how funny it was and how the humor you, that you use was not just darts thrown at your opponents, but often at yourself. Can you say a bit more about how you think about humor and use it, including self-directed, for political purposes in an era where humor is less and less likely to be seen and is often only used when weaponizing against someone else? Humor in politics. Well, I, you know, first of all, I, I never really, uh, it wasn't a uh, well thought out strategy about, I, you know, I think I should try to use humor to, to reach a political end. I just, it's just my personality. And so I wrote, wrote the book as if I were just talking to my friends. And that's just with me, I think one of the reasons I've been successful in politics, but people say to me all the time, um, I don't agree with you on all the issues, but I really think that, you know, you, you're telling it like it is and that you're a genuine person. Um, you're just like us and that you really do care. Um, and I think, you know, I just try to be very natural. And I think there's a lot of distrust or mistrust with people in political uh, office, office that, that there's a lot of spin and uh, a lot of people, you know, very scripted. But I think what people really want is you know, somebody that's genuine and, uh, and, and that's just a straight shooter and telling it like it is. And that seems to uh, resonate with a lot of people. And I guess I am, I guess, you know, humor, I, I joke around a lot with my friends and my staff and my family, anybody I come in contact with. And uh, I don't hide that from the public. So I, I'll be joking in a press conference or in the book or, and I think people, people do. I think sometimes instead of the angry rhetoric, uh, a little self-deprecating humor uh, can take the edge off of a, of a discussion and, and, and make, make people just uh, relate to you better. But I think it's more about being genuine. And they don't see a lot of that in politics today. And clearly the human element looms large in your political style as reflected in your earlier comment on literally going into the city of Baltimore, walking in those neighborhoods, meeting those groups. Can you just say a word or two about how the pandemic era has affected kind of your approach and style to politics where increasingly engagement is through Zoom rather than what you really seem to like, which is meeting with people and, and, and going into their communities? Well, it's very, it's very insightful uh, question because it's so true. It's the thing that I've been most frustrated with because I, I really am a people person uh, at heart. And uh, it's one of the things, I, you know, there's a lot of things I don't like about politics. But the one thing I do like is I get to engage with and, and, and get to interact with and meet a lot of people. I love listening to people. I love meeting people. And, and I would not only walk the streets of Baltimore and hug people whose homes were burned out or, or listen to uh, people who were you know, frustrated and angry and protesters and try to listen to their concerns. But I also just love shaking hands and going out to an Orioles game or a Ravens game. And, uh, and I like hugging people in parades. And so being cloistered and doing everything on Zoom is very hard to get used to. And even when I'm out now, you can't shake hands. You can't really get close to people. And, uh, you know, I'm able to do more meetings because of Zoom, because you can't you don't have to travel. I, I would love to be in Michigan. Uh, I'd love to be in Ann Arbor and visit my folks. But sitting here in the office with you uh, is uh, you can get more of it done. But it, there, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, but you really lose the human touch when you're not seeing somebody face to face and interacting. 
And who would have thought in the middle of September, the Baltimore Orioles and the Detroit Tigers would be in competition, and yet we can't go to Camden Yards or Comerica Park, have a beer and watch those games. Yeah, uh, well, no, that's true. Very true. Well, we haven't lost as many games as we used to because we were not playing as many. Yeah. I checked this morning. There, two teams are almost statistically uh, tied. You know, time to turn to some what of, of, of some of our colleagues and friends are, are are asking. And the first question is to describe some of the policies that you have implemented that you're most proud of. Yeah, but also some that you're not so proud of. <clears throat> Well, that's a good question. Um, for the ones that I'm proud of, we've accomplished a heck of a lot. So I, I first ran for a governor. I was a small business owner who had never held elective office before, as you mentioned. And I, although I knew a little bit about politics and had been involved and I cared a lot about my state, our state had uh, raised taxes 43 times in a row and it caused an economic collapse. Our overall economic performance was 49th out of 50 states. We were losing businesses, jobs, and taxpayers who were fleeing out of the state. So my main focus, and the reason I ran for governor, was to try to turn that economy around, to try to you know put more people back to work, to, to relieve the, the, the burden that was on struggling Marylanders and on small businesses, and to grow our economy. And uh, that, that was our focus. And we've been very successful at that. Haven't had a single tax increase in the five and a half years that I've been governor. We went from uh, 49th out of 50 states to the top 10. We had the greatest economic uh, turnaround in, in America. Uh, that's been uh, somewhat hurt by the pandemic recently, as we're like everyone else, people are suffering. Um, but our, our economy is doing about 25% better than the rest of the country. And our unemployment is lower than you know many other states. I think 35 other states. So the, the economics, helping people, growing our economy, putting more people to work, more jobs than ever before in the history of the state, uh, more uh, businesses open than ever before. And we're hoping to get back to that after with our economic recovery. But other issues as well. So on uh, criminal justice reform, I was uh, one of the earliest and we had the, one of the most uh, uh, progressive um, uh, efforts to reform our criminal justice system. We passed the Justice Reinvestment Act together with the overwhelmingly Democratic uh, uh, legislature, both houses, and it really was a bipartisan effort uh, where we passed things like the Second Chance Act, where we reduced our prison population by more than 49 other states. We were number one in the country. Um, we lowered uh, the sentences for things like uh, possession. We tried to refocus Many people were in our criminal justice system and in our correctional facilities were all dealing with uh, substance abuse or mental health issues. And so we spent more money on, on uh, um, getting them the help that they need with the treatment programs and, and uh, mental health counseling. And, and we tore down the Baltimore City Jail. Uh, but we, we, we really focused on, um, it, it saved us money in the correctional facility and it helped a lot of people um, get out from incarceration. So it was a really a Republican and a Democratic idea. On health care, uh, um, when Washington was broken and we had Democrats saying, we have to keep Obamacare exactly the way it is and we don't want to change anything. And we had Republicans saying, let's throw it all out because you know the, the costs are too high. Um, we in Maryland came together, Republicans and Democrats, with some very creative uh, health insurance policies that lowered we kept everyone covered, expanded our coverage for hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people, um, but also lowered the uh, health care insurance rates dramatically um, by, I think, 25% over a two-year period um, with, for the first time in 10 years. So we tried to address both problems. Those folks that were struggling to try to pay the, the, um, their, their, their uh, health insurance coverage and the folks that were not getting coverage. So um, th those are a couple of examples. I don't want to Talk, I mean, I could go on. It, it, we've put record funding in education. We, the Chesapeake Bay is the cleanest it's, it's been in recorded history. We you know, put twice as much money in, 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 in environmental protection efforts. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we've got a lot of things we're proud of and none of it would get done without Republicans and Democrats working together. Somewhat relatedly, another question is the advice that you would have for students or others going into politics who are truly interested in nonpartisan policy solutions, what would you advise? 
Well, first of all, I hope that you have a lot of students that are like that because that's what we desperately need in America. And uh, the young people today, um, I'm hoping, are, are willing to look at things as I'm, as I'm describing. Um, I think that many of them are. Um, and I think it really is the solution. We've proven in Maryland um, that, that, that it can be done. And, uh, and if we can do it here, there's probably almost nowhere it can't be accomplished. But, you know, I was a, a political science uh, major in college and was idealistic and, and you know, but interested in, in, in policy and, and uh, what I could do to make things better. And, and I, I'm just so pleased that you have so many students that are focused on these things. But I, I, I'll give a shameless plug. Um, you know, I've started a, a national foundation. I, my book, every penny of the book, we donate to a group called An America United, where we focus on um, that bipartisanship and, and bringing people together. I think there are a number of other good organizations like No Labels as Democrats and Republicans trying to come together in a bipartisan caucus. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a very important topic and I'm hoping that many of your st students are interested and, uh, and I hope they will uh, try to take a look at um, solution, problem solving, pragmatism, and uh, finding a way to do something about this divisive and angry politics we have today. Thank you. Um, additional question. Republicans and Democrats seem to exist in completely separate media worlds. How do you speak to your constituents when knowledge on basic issues varies so widely? It's a huge uh, issue. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons for uh, the, the divisiveness in America, but I really believe that part of the problem is the way we, uh, you know, it, it has to do with the media bubbles that we're in, depending on our perspective. It has to do with social media, where there's this echo chamber of this group only listens to these folks and this group only listens to these people over here. And they both have, in some cases, completely alternative, you know, versions of, of the news. And I think it's important for us to kind of break down those walls because it, that people that if you're watching, say, MSNBC every night, you can't imagine what in the heck these people that watch Fox are talking about. And if you're watching Fox, you, you're like you're hearing a completely different version of the news. I, um, maybe it, it, part of my bipartisanship, I end up flipping channels back and forth to hear the two perspectives. And it seems like we're talking about entirely different worlds. Uh, but you also, I think that, I think Twitter and Facebook and all those social media, you don't really talk to the people on the other side. You don't hear the news from the other side and you don't get to really, um, you know, nobody's ever always right or wrong. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, all of the news that we get, um, uh, I think, uh, on television or in the print media or on social media, especially, uh, has a slant to it. And, um, I think it's important for the smart students to kind of dig through that and, 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 uh, you know, think for themselves and, and gather the, as much information because there's certainly people that, are getting information that's really not uh, not factual, <laughs> and they're making decisions based on that, and they keep talking to each other. And, and how, as a governor, do you approach that when you're right next to the big national media center of Washington D.C.? You're in a medium-sized state, and, and how do you try to communicate to reach those broad kinds of audiences? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I am very uh, active and visible. I, I, I've try, I tried to avoid most of the national media, especially um, the cable channels. But I, I mean, I, I, I do go on there occasionally. And like I'm on, on Fox, they might try to get me to, you know, to, to bash uh, Democrats more. And if I'm on CNN, they want me to just bash the president. But I, I continue to talk like I'm talking to you, regardless of what the outlet is. I say the same thing. I don't have one message for one group and one message for the other. I also, even though social media frustrates me um, uh, with, with kind of the, the angry voices, uh, the, the, the small portions of people that are, you know, yelling and screaming, uh, it is a great way to reach people directly. And so um, we, we do a, a stream all of our press conferences. I'm, you know, have a couple of Facebook pages and Twitter and, and uh, we try to just get our message directly out. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's difficult. We're right next to, you know, I'm sitting here in Annapolis, our state capital, and we're 30 minutes from uh, the center of divisive, divisiveness and dysfunction, which is Washington, D.C. Next question from one of our viewers. Tell us a little bit about 
the Republican Party in particular, your hopes for the future of the party that you've been in linked to your entire life, attending a Republican convention at a very early age, if I remember correctly, getting in trouble with your dad for supporting yeah. the wrong candidate, at least in his view at that time. What are your hopes for its future? You know, I, I am hopeful for the, the future of the of both my party and the country, but I'm concerned. And I, and I believe we really do have to take a hard look. And I, I think that right after this November election, which is fast approaching, regardless of what happens, I, I believe that there's going to have to be, we're going to sit down and try to decide which direction the Republican Party goes. Uh, quite frankly, I think the Democrats should do the same thing <laughs> um, be, because um, I think just taking a look at where we're going to be in the, in the future. But I, I, back to our discussion about Gerald Ford uh, and, you know, the, the time frame in the 70s and 80s and Gerald Ford and, and Ronald Reagan. And, you know, I, I would like to see us return the Republican Party to, you know, a more hopeful, positive vision and a more willingness to work across the aisle. Of course, Gerald Ford was terrific at that, even though he was the minority leader, uh, really working with Democrats. Ronald Reagan, who uh, came in and worked very well with Tip O'Neill, who was the Democratic Speaker of the House. I mean, I, I would like to see the Republican Party be a more a bigger tent, which, which Reagan talked about. I really believe that successful politics is about addition and multipl multiplication instead of uh, about subtraction and division. And we seem to be shrinking the tent and having a lot more uh, division and subtraction. And I, I think we need to reverse that course and talk to people that are like, I've gone into, I've won, I mentioned uh, suburban women. I've won over huge percentages of Democrats. I have a 70% approval rating among African-Americans statewide, which almost no Republican does. And I, part of it is just being willing to talk to people who aren't in your bubble <laughs> and and to go out and listen and and to try to just be honest and and focus on problem solving and uh, and and bringing people together because what we're seeing now isn't working i mean it really isn't on either side the next question touches upon a little different dimension of kind of reaching outside your bubble literally to people in other party in other states it asks, what, if anything, do you feel like you have in common with other cross-party governors? In this case, Steve Bullock. Yeah. From, tell us about that. Well, it's a great uh, question. Steve Bullock was the chairman of the National Governors Association uh, before me. And he was all, he's sort of a, 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 a we're totally different uh, states, but uh, he, you know, he was a Democratic governor in a Republican state. And I'm a Republican governor in a Democratic state. And as a result, I think, um, you know, we're, we, we, out of necessity, if we ever wanted to accomplish anything, we had to work across the aisle and get things done. And we, we both did. Steve and I became very good friends. I was the vice chairman. Uh, this, this, it rotates Democrat to Republican every year. So I was his vice chairman, and then I became chairman. Governor Cuomo from New York was my vice chairman. But Steve Bullock and I, are, are a, an example of, you know, how do you get elected in a state that's a different party? And how do you stay there and get reelected? Um, you must, you have to be able to work with the other side. And I, it turns out, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier about, you, you said most, most popular governor. It's really, I have the highest job approval rating uh, of the governor. And Charlie Baker from Massachusetts and I are the, and, and, and Phil Scott in Vermont. We, we're in democratic states as Republicans and we're, we're not just, it's not popular, it's not a popularity context, but they approve of the job we're doing because I think it's what, it's what Republicans want and it's what Democrats want and it's what independents want. And that's just, you know, getting things done. Uh, they, they want their the leaders to be honest and they want them to solve the problems and they don't want the, uh, the name calling and the uh, demonization, the divisiveness and the, and the anger and frustration that we're seeing in Washington. Governor, you know, we could, I would love to extend this conversation indefinitely, but we are running against the clock. I'd like to pose one last question from one of our colleagues. And it deals with the issue, we've talked a bit about it earlier, the pandemic. It asks, if we could go back in time to January of this year, how would you redo the coronavirus response of the federal government, especially given all that you now know? 
Well, you know, I talk about this in my book. Uh, uh, I, back in February, I think it was February 6th, we had the National Governors Association uh, meeting in Washington. So all the governors convened on Washington. We we had a, a group from uh, of leaders from the federal government with uh, Anthony Fauci and Dr. Robert Redfield and others come tell all the governors, you know, what we were about to be faced with. And it was a very sobering message. I, we had already been looking at this and working on it in our state since early January when things first started happening. And we were following what was going on in Asia and we were gearing up and getting ready. The federal government, I think there were people in the federal government who were aware of what the potential might be and who were trying to get prepared. But I think the biggest mistake was not taking it seriously. Um, and, and I think the, the president's messaging uh, was really terrible, um, you know, con continuing to downplay the virus and say it was going to disappear and uh, to belittling the seriousness of it. Um, even though he was getting some expert advice from people throughout his administration who had given all the governor's advice. So I think we had, we should have taken it more seriously sooner. Um, we should have developed the national testing strategy. We should have ramped up production of, uh, of the uh, PPE. We were running out of things like swabs and transport mediums and tubes and ventilators. And um, it, it's amazing to me that we weren't prepared earlier. And especially when we kind of all knew at some point we might have a respiratory uh, virus. Uh, we didn't know anything about this particular one, but uh, I think everybody was caught flat-footed. So I, I think being more prepared, listening to the scientists as we have done here in Maryland, and uh, and taking quick, decisive action, uh, which is what we had to do in our states. Okay. We need to close. I wish I could offer you a walking tour to revisit the big house and through central mm -hmm. campus. That's not an option today, but we will all look forward to the day when that does become a possibility. I want to begin just by noting that we have a very large and diverse audience today, a reflection certainly on the interest in this topic. And I want to thank everyone who's been participating in this broadcast for your engagement, including the many, many questions. We were not able to ask all of them. Uh, we would have had to order out dinner and be here for quite some time, but we had a lot of interest and I really appreciate the thoughtful questions. Finally, Governor Hogan, I just simply want to thank you on behalf of the entire Ford School community for your openness, your willingness to participate and engaging us in a very, very thoughtful conversation. And we will continue to watch with interest as you continue to tell the story of your book, but also continue to pursue these enormous challenges for you in the state of Maryland, but on a much broader stage. And so we wish you well, continued good health, and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, to our to our out to all of our viewers, we just invite you to stay attentive to the Ford School website. It's newly redesigned website for our uh, in our social media pages over many many upcoming virtual events that the Ford School will be offering in the weeks and months ahead in what looks like a very exciting and engaging fall term. So thanks to all, and again, Governor Hogan, thanks so much to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm sorry I wasn't in, in Ann Arbor. I look forward to uh, having that opportunity soon, but thank you all for listening in and uh, go blue. <laughs> Thanks very much.